Please join for the scripture reading, 1 Peter 1, 3 to 9. Blessed be the God of the, and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, even if now for a little while you have had to suffer various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold that, though perishable, is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Although you have not seen him, you love him, and even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy, for you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Do either of you know what a security blanket is? You've never heard the phrase security blanket? <laughs> but I don't know, so I have no idea what they are combined. Well, let me ask you this. Do you have a favorite thing yes. that no matter where you go out of the house, you need to take that with you? What is it? Does he look something like this? Yes. <laughs> what was your... Well, I like that, and I also like, um, what's the one that you said that you like? Yeah, oh, yeah. My daughter had a teddy bear, and she had to take it everywhere. Everywhere. Now, some, some of you said you used to, and you, you may have heard a mom or a dad or a grandma say, you don't need that anymore. You're all grown up, you, you're all grown up, you, you're all grown up, and so you don't need that little security fluffy, that teddy bear or that blanket, okay? I have some thoughts about that. All those adults who tell you that. Okay. What kind of security blankets do you think most of the adults in this room have right now? Um, you like your phone. <laughs> you mean this? Have you ever heard mom and dad say, I forgot my phone, I feel naked without it? All right? Every adult in this room that has this, that's a security blanket. What other security blankets do they have? Let's try you. Uh, I, a security uh, iPad. An iPad. A wallet. A wallet. How about keys. keys? Keys are how we can get into our car to drive home. Keys are how we can get back into our home. Keys are our security blanket as adults. We, we can't get around without these two things. They're our security blankets. So I don't like the notion that you're all grown up. You don't need a security blanket anymore. Because as Christians, we all do have a security blanket. Guess what that security blanket is? Jesus, all right? Jesus has done something special for us. Jesus has breathed for us his Holy Spirit. He has given us his Holy Spirit to help and guide us on the way, to be our security when we're 
on our journey and maybe sometimes unsure of where we're going. So if someone were to say to you, you're all grown up and you don't need that little fluffy and you don't need that sense of security, I don't think that's right. I think you're right to say, I do need that security blanket. I do need Jesus' spirit to guide me every day. And you need to know that it is always there for you to help and keep you safe. So you're saying, you're saying a teddy bear will keep you safe? And, and it, a, t- a teddy bear can give you a sense of security. I don't say the Holy Spirit is in that. Okay, that's different. But if it makes you feel safe, that's okay. All right, because all of us, every one of us, need to feel safe. And if it's a teddy bear, a phone, or keys, or God's spirit, that's what it's there for. Okay? Why don't you all join me in prayer? Dear Father God, we thank you for the gift of your Christ and your love and your mercy. But we also thank you that in his absence you have given us your spirit, your spirit to be with us at all times, to walk with us, to guide with us, to breathe into us a sense of security in knowing that we are in your hands. And in his name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Today's gospel reading comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. Hear the word of God. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house of the disciples had been met, where they met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So when the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord, but he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark in his side, I will not believe. And one week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. And although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he turned and said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet come to believe. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name the word of God for the people of God. So this passage in John begins the story of the culmination of Jesus' first day of resurrection. He has risen, he has revealed himself to Mary Magdalene, and he has instructed her to tell his disciples that he has risen, and she dutifully does what she is instructed and told to do. The disciples are locked in a room, hiding in fear, no doubt huddling in their grief 
over what has happened. This news that Mary brings, this overwhelmingly good news is received, how can I characterize it? I think it's fair to say with confusion. They knew with certainty that Jesus was crucified, that he was dead, that he was buried. But this, this news that Mary has brought, what, what did this mean? Peter and John ran to inspect the tomb. It was empty, just as she has said. But they returned to their rooms only with questions, not answers. And once there, they relocked the doors again. Now, grief is a very strong emotion. And it is one that is very real and cannot be dismissed if we are to understand the motivations and actions of the disciples. Grief can take control of us and force us out of our normal pattern of behavior and push us down a rabbit hole where it can be difficult to see the light of day, much less the light of the risen Christ. So here in probably the same upper room that they had celebrated Jesus' last supper, they are locked away in fear and sorrow and grief. But there is one more thing that I want to call your attention to. For the most part, the disciples are there together. That they shared their grief and their fear in community. It is a very human thing, a very Jewish thing, a very Christian thing and way of dealing with loss that death brings. Not to be trite, but misery really does prefer company. Most of the time. Most of the time, but not for Thomas. Thomas chose to deal with his grief, his sorrow, his pain in his own private way. John doesn't account for where Thomas was or why he wasn't with the others. So, This gives us an opportunity for conjecture. Perhaps Thomas could have been in the garden praying for strength and guidance, for the same strength and guidance that Jesus had received from the Father just a few nights before. He could have been standing at Golgotha wondering what has happened. What had gone so terribly wrong? Retracing the events of the day. He had said to the others, let us go with him so that we may die with him. He might have been asking himself, why wasn't he there? Why didn't he die with Jesus as he had suggested? We don't know. John doesn't tell us. But more than the other three gospels, John focuses on Thomas and makes him the center of attention in this part of the resurrection story. John tells us more about Thomas in just these few verses than we can learn anywhere else in the other three Gospels. So I want to take a look at Thomas and ask why John focuses so narrowly on him in the aftermath of Jesus' resurrection. What do we know about Thomas? In John 11, at the time when Jesus decides to go back to Jerusalem, to go to Martha and Mary, and to grieve with them over the passing of their brother Lazarus, at that moment, the disciples try to talk Jesus out of returning there. The last time he was there, the Jewish authorities tried to stone him. In their opinion, this was a bad idea, just plain crazy. No! Don't go there. But John tells us it was Thomas. Thomas who said to the others, let us go that we may die with him. Thomas was the one whose courage was the strength the others needed. So what does that tell us about Thomas? First, I think he has a firm grip on reality. He is perceptive, and he realizes the dangers in going back to Jerusalem. 
but he also knows there's no talking Jesus out of what he has planned. He knows this man Jesus is headstrong and cannot be swayed. He knows that Jesus has a plan. He doesn't understand it, but he knows there's no de derailing Jesus from his path. We learn here that Thomas is totally devoted and loyal to Jesus. That is, to the real man he can see in front of him. And that's an important detail we need to know. Thomas's character in Jesus's story. But we also learn from this brief verse that Thomas has the courage to follow Jesus, even to his death, or so he thought. Then he returns to the others and, say, and says, let us go that we may die with him also. If this was as far as this was going to go, if this is how he wants it to end, then without hesitation, we must support him and go with him, no matter the consequences. Thomas's devotion and loyalty are a total commitment as close to the point of death as his humanity could take him. Thomas wanted to be loyal to the man Jesus that he could feel and see in front of him. Maybe Jesus had Thomas in mind when he said, greater love has no man than this, that he would lay down his life for his friends. Maybe he saw that love and devotion in Thomas. All right, now, here I'm going to take a brief detour from John. There is in Christian legend a storyline that Thomas was also a carpenter. I don't know if it's true, but it's interesting if it is true. Now, in my experience, I have come to know that there are carpenters and there are carpenters. I have a brother who's a minister out in Long Island, and he, like Paul, is a tent maker. He has a secular job to support his ministry and his family. He, for a time, was a cabinet maker. He had done some amazing work that appeared in the Manhattan Architectural Digest magazine. And in bragging in conversation with a friend of mine, I told that friend that my brother was a carpenter. And I related that story to my brother only to find he was visibly insulted. I am not a carpenter. To which I responded, oh, really? Well, what are you? A cabinet maker. I chuckled and I asked, what's the difference? About three sixteenths of an inch, he replied with all seriousness. In other words, his work needed to be exacting to a fine line. His work demanded no margin for error, no guesswork, no eyeballing, no broad strokes, only fine lines. If Thomas was a carpenter, I think he was that kind of carpenter. You can tell from what we learn about him that he will believe what he sees in front of him if it's presented in fine and exacting detail. For instance, at the final supper, Jesus tries to assure the disciples that he is going to the Father to prepare a place for them, that he will return for them and that they will know the way. But it is Thomas who says to Jesus, how can we know the way? In other words, I need details. I need to have more information. Be specific. Tell us where you are going and how we will know the way. Jesus builds for us, or John builds for us, a character in Thomas that is devoted and loyal to Jesus, but at the same time, demanding of details. In other words, just don't tell me the cut is about a quarter of an inch. Tell me precisely to the 16th of an inch what the cut is. Jesus tries to tell Thomas, if you know me, you know the Father. 
If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Jesus tried to reveal to Thomas what he needed when he said, I am the way and the truth and the life. But as I read that passage, I get the visual image in my head of Thomas's reaction. And it might be something like if we were trying to understand Stephen Hawking's explaining his theory of bending time and light. Like any of us, I see Thomas listening and nodding and saying, okay, I guess. All of us, all, all of this gives us some insight into Thomas's and how he decided to deal with his grief over the loss of this man that he loved and was devoted to. Thomas couldn't find his solace in a community locked in fear behind closed doors. Whether he was isolating himself in his own pain or retracing the steps of Jesus hunting for those answers, Thomas was searching for the real hard details that this real man Jesus had spoken of. Jesus spoke of the way. Where is the way? How do I find it? How do I know it? How can I know it? Where is the way so that I can follow him? So when Jesus first appears to the disciples in that closed room, Thomas is not there. Thomas is searching for answers, but because he has isolated himself in his own reality and grief, he has missed the opportunity to find the way he was looking for. So when the other disciples tell Thomas, we have seen the Lord, he responds with his characteristic demand for exacting details, for some hard visual evidence that I can see and understand. Unless I see the mark of the nail in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. I can, I can hear him saying, I am a carpenter. I know exactly what size nails were used to crucify him and exactly how large the hole in his hands would be. I need to see that and measure it for myself so that I know to one sixteenth of an inch it is really him. Now a lot of us approach our believing this way. We think that having faith means having to know all the details and having all the answers. But it doesn't always work that way, hardly ever, as a matter of fact. Fortunately for Thomas, Jesus was still around to provide him with what he needed. But it is not the same for us. For us, believing is a matter of believing in things unseen. So now in John's story, a week passes, and we have the disciples locked away in that room again. But this time, Thomas is with them. The doors are shut. John makes clear about that. And Jesus enters into their midst and greets them. Peace be with you. And then he turns to Thomas and invites him to put his fingers in his hands, in the wounds, and his hand in Jesus' sight. Come, do these holes fit your notion of what size the nails had to be? You doubt that it's really me, the real man who you loved with that complete devotion and loyalty. Come and touch the physical evidence that you need to assuage your doubts. Now, my friends, we have to take pause here. We have to take a moment here because this is the critical moment for all humankind. This is the moment when humankind witnesses and affirms for the first time the coming together of God's kingdom heaven and God's created earth. 
This is the moment when God's kingdom comes. It is in the presence of the Christ standing before Thomas. It happens when Thomas utters the words, my Lord and my God. Thomas is the first one who is ever recorded by John or any gospel writer to acknowledge that right there in front of him in this room of believers was the intersection of God's kingdom come on earth and God's will being done. That is a moment for us to take pause. In that moment, Thomas recognizes that not only is this man Jesus, his Lord, his teacher, his leader, and his friend, but standing before him was his God as well. John closes the story by having Jesus say to Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. In this moment, I perceive grace. I feel that Jesus understands the difficulty that Thomas has in understanding and in believing. And he is accepting of Thomas's weaknesses. So in this gracious moment, I believe Jesus forgives Thomas his doubts. Jesus loves those of us who come to him based truly on faith in the truth of the witness provided by John and the other gospel writers. Blessed are those who have not seen and have yet come to believe. But he, but he also loves and understands those of us who have difficulty. When we need something more, and when we need encouragement, and when we need bolstering up, for us, he doesn't come to provide physical evidence as he did for Thomas. For us, he has given us his spirit, his church, his community of believers. He has not only given us the example of his faith in the Father by going to the cross, but also he has given us a community of saints, real people in our lives, in whom we can also see the Spirit at work through their own love and devotion to the Father God. So whether your faith is rock solid like a saint's or wobbly and in need of shoring up like Thomas's, know that Jesus still comes to be with you. His presence is real. It may not be a physical one as it was for Thomas, but his spirit is always there to bolster you up and lift you up. Amen.